don't settle. Do not settle. A lot of people put their career success in the hands of others. You have to be your biggest cheering day. Heather Elkington is a leadership coach, author, and social media star helping new managers become high-performing leaders. I was an assistant manager managing eight people. Every single one of them were older than me. Within the first few weeks, I had to fire someone. I barely had any context. Why on earth am I here? Why have they given me this job? I was obsessed with working. I was working three jobs while I was at school, while I was doing my A-levels. I was just completely addicted. Do I need to go to university to be a leader? No, absolutely not. It doesn't matter that you are 21 years old and it doesn't matter that you've had barely any experience. I went from managing a very small team to being the operations director, working with thousands of people, leading five different teams. What advice do you have for younger people about how to have difficult conversations? Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. If you're a regular here, there's a very easy way to show your support and to help us grow. Download the Fountain app on your mobile, follow Anatomy of a Leader with Maria Vorostovsky, and just start listening. You can share your thoughts on this episode by sending a boost. It's like a payment with a message. And see what other listeners have to say or create clips that you could share with others. Getting started is super easy and you can top up your Fountain wallet with your bank card. Oh, and you can also earn rewards by listening to the Fountain app too. It's seriously a no brainer. Follow the link in the show notes or visit fountain.fm to find out more. Heather, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you for having me. Now, great to have you on the show. I was very excited to talk to you after I have found you on Instagram, of yes. all places. Uh, you're a leadership coach, but you have a very interesting story. You know, um, even had a stint at Harrods from memory. So I'd love sure, to kind yeah. of touch on that um, as they were a client of mine for a little while, very early in my career. Nice. And then leading a startup, which then got sold and now becoming a leadership coach. So for those people who don't know who you are, it would be very helpful just to get a very quick background on who you are, how you started and what you're doing now. I grew up in a mining town in the north of England called Doncaster, which is probably the fa my favourite thing about who I am is the fact that I grew up up north and grew up in a very working class environment. My dad worked down the mines until they got shut. My mum worked in um, a bank, just a shop front of a bank. And growing up, I just got to see sheer like grit. So Doncaster, for anyone who doesn't know, is a place where it has in the past been incredibly working class. When all the pits got closed, it went through huge transformation because all of a sudden lots of people were out of work, but all the people that were out of work were in, like super tough, intelligent, had been through a lot in their life, had seen a lot. A lot of them had been managing teams underground, had been used to working miles underground every single day. And they had been through like wildly tough conditions. So when they closed, there was a lot of skill and not a lot of jobs. Over the past 20 or 30 years since that happened, all of those people, and this is like the generation that I got to see, went on to do incredible things. So most of the people around me, I have seen have great rags to riches stories. I've seen my uncle sell a business for tens of millions of pounds. I've seen my dad go from driving trains underground to like working his way up in the corporate ladder to be like MD of one of the biggest companies in the country. My mum go from working on a shop floor in a bank to starting her own business, now multi-million pound turnover. She runs that business still, online e-commerce business. And this all happened at, kind of at the end of my childhood. So I got to see all this between the ages of maybe like 10 and 17. I saw all this incredible, just grit turning, rag, rags to riches story. Um, I was obsessed with working from like, as soon as I can remember, I used to iron clothes for my mum for like five pence an item. I used to, everything I could possibly do around the house. I was like 20 pence to unload the dishwasher, you know, going out, I was completely obsessed. Moving through school, as soon as I was 15, I got a job working in a restaurant. I got a job working on my mum's, in my mum's shop on a Saturday and I was working 
I gave up my lunchtime at school to work with the dinner ladies at the time and serve dinner to my friends. So I gave it up. I gave up my lunchtime so I could serve food to my friends at school. Seven pound an hour. It was amazing at the time. So I was working three jobs while I was at school, while I was doing my A-levels. I was just completely addicted to working. What that did was set me up for as soon as I entered like the proper kind of career ladder corporate world, I had a huge bank of experience. I went straight into a management position um, at Harrods, pretty much. I went to university in between then. I don't talk about university a lot because I did a business management degree, but it means nothing. I have, cannot remember anything from it. So as soon as I finished uni, I was working at uni as well, but as soon as I finished uni, I went straight into a um, assistant manager role at Harrods. While I was working at Harrods, I was on the shop floor, so serving customers, customers who spent, they were called black card customers, and they spent over a million pound a year in the shop. So like these hugely, hugely wealthy customers from all over the world. And it was like a, it was like a catapult into Doncaster working class world straight into the elite of Britain. Like these people just blew my mind every single day. They'd open their bag and have stacks and stacks of 50 pound notes that they just, you know, like if someone came and took a handful, they probably wouldn't even notice. But while I was in that job at Harrods, I was an assistant manager managing eight people. Every single one of them were older than me. And within the first few weeks, I had to fire someone. I had to let someone go. I barely had any context. I just got told from my manager, you need to let this person go today. Can you do it? And because I had quite a lot of imposter syndrome and thinking, why on earth am I here? Why have they given me this job? At any moment, they're going to find out I'm not who I say I am. I'm not as good as I think I am. I thought, I can't back out. I can't tell anyone I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to have to pretend this is like the 50th time I've fired someone. I'm just going to have to do it. So took the lady downstairs. She was probably 15 years older than me, I guess. So I was in my very early 20s. She's probably 50, 15 years older than me. And I said, letting you go kind of explain the reasoning. And she just looked me straight in the eye and was like, you can't do that. <laughs> She's like, basically, she was angry. So like everything she said after that, I barely understood what she was saying because she was so angry and it cut, this anger was just like steaming out of her. But she basically said in a very short way, you don't know what you do and you can't tell me I've not got my job. So then she went to my manager to get the confirmation and she had in fact lost her job. After that, I was just a shell of a human being. I was like, I can't tell anybody off. And I'm going to say that in quotation marks because that was in my head at the time what I thought managers did. I can't tell anyone off. I can't like pull anyone up on anything. So all I did was become a massive people pleaser. I would look for opportunities to praise people because I think that would, would be what would make them like me. Give everyone opportunity find opportunities to praise people but never ever ever address the difficult feedback i mean that's a really traumatic experience to go through especially a young age were you given any training at all mm -hmm. you were just sort of sent in there saying okay just buy this person oh uh -huh. yeah absolutely that's not very fair either. no mm. um no training but honestly at the time i didn't think this company oh this company haven't given me any training they should have i thought Heather, you've chucked yourself in at the deep end with this job. You need to figure this out. Like, you should know these things. You need to figure it out. What, if I could go back and tell myself, would be go and ask for support and go and ask for help. And I'd also tell myself, it doesn't matter that you are 21 years old and it doesn't matter that you've had barely an experience because you this, this thing you're about to do, which is let someone go, is never going to be easy. So even when you're seven years into doing this and you've done it you have done it 50 times it's still going to be hard and people are still going to get angry and people are still going to make you you're still going to feel like i shouldn't be doing this someone older than me should be doing this so yeah that's what i wish i could go back and tell myself mm. um and then so that was 21 i'm 28 now between those years i went into a SaaS startup left harrods went into a SaaS startup and I worked, and this, this is advice for anyone who is either at the beginning of their career or just looking for a career change, go and work in a tiny company. Go and work in the smallest company you can possibly find. 
that are growing and potentially like new and bringing on new technology and stuff. I only worked for this SaaS company for about a year, but I was the right hand woman to the CEO. I was the executive assistant right hand woman to the CEO and just probably got 10 years of life experience in just a year because you see everything. You see HR, you see um, marketing, you see sales, you see investment, like building your pitch deck, all of these, this huge wealth of experience. I was in essentially a PA role. If I had have gone to a bigger company in a PA role, you would have gotten none of that. You would have been an admin person. You would have been expected to just do the tick box task. But you go to a small company, you are thrown in at the deep end with everything and you get to learn so much. And so I, a question I often get asked now is, do I need to go to university to be a leader? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. But leave your hometown and go and work for a company where you can be as close as possible to the founder and or CEO or, you know, the high a senior management team. You will learn the same amount in six months as you would at university. I totally agree. I mean, I did the same thing working for a small kind of boutique early on and seeing how all of the cogs work and fit in. You know, you don't get the same kind of experience working with within a bigger organization because you're much more siloed. Um, so yeah, no, that's a very good piece of advice. Mm -hmm. And going back to this early experience of being obsessed with work and, you know, charging your parents 50p or whatever for 5p for, for ironing clothes, was that something that was coming from you or your parents sort of instilled that into you? What happened there? Who knows? Born or made, who knows? But I think um, the more I get older, if you'd have asked me five years ago, I'd have been like, it's all me, it's all me. But the more I get older, I can I can, and, and go through therapy and just understand more about the world. I can see how my parents had a huge impact on the person I was. And because my parents, when they were going through this transformation, so the mines closed um, and my dad had started to like work in corporate and work more and my mum started a business and she started working more. I, I was at home a lot on my own um, and was looking after my brother. And so I became very independent, like really quickly to the point where I actually think I took on like a bit of a motherly role to my brother. Um, and my brother used to get upset because he was a bit younger than me. He was four or five years younger than me. And he used to get upset because my parents went allowed around a lot, but I was a bit older. And so I was just in like those teenage years where I was like, yeah, I've got the house to myself. This is amazing. But in those years, I just became super, super, super independent right the way through up to like when you sort of 16, 17 and you start to really crave your independence and going out you know and you get curfews and all those things from your parents but you're still living at home because I was so independent my mum just gave every ounce of trust to me like she trusted me so deeply she would be the mum who like whilst everyone else's parents were giving them these strict curfews and you know basically not letting them make any mistakes my mum trusted me so much because she'd seen how I'd helped around the house and how I'd helped bring my brother up that when I like went into the 16, 17s, 18s of my life, she was like, yeah, you're good. Go off and do your own thing. And obviously you make mistakes and you do stupid things, but that it was that like that independence that they definitely gave me. And you get a taste of that when you're maybe like 12, 13 years old. And I'm like, I want to make money. I want to take on the world. I want to move to London. Like everything. I was just next, next, next. Like, I was just filled with another thing my parents definitely gave me. My dad is the biggest optimist in the world. Uh, any situation he can like put rose taint spectacles on it. And they just filled me with like confidence and love. And I think this is one of the biggest privileges I've been ever afforded in life is just parents who at every single minute told me, you can do whatever you want. You will be successful but not in the sense of go out and make money and be like, they would be happy if I was 
working in a shop and kind of didn't have like a financially successful life but they just filled me with this love that you can do anything you want and we'll be proud of you we don't care as long you know don't end up in prison don't do drugs but other than that we're proud of you um so they definitely filled me with that and I obviously just took that as a bit of a runway and just took it all and just went off and I was like woohoo yeah I'm interested in this aspect of independence and at which point because my my theory is that every strength is a weakness Mm -hmm. and every weakness can be a strength so there's almost like a bell curve at one point you know being super independent gets you to you know make your own decisions you know be super motivated because you really want to do it but then there comes a point where it no longer serves you have you had that experience i haven't yet but i can see how that I think that'll be coming for me at some point in life. Um, I, I feel like it's waiting for me somewhere. If you ask my friends or my partner, they'll call me a control freak. Like I am, every aspect of my life is controlled by me and, I, and the things that I can't control, I don't worry about. Like I'm almost like the opposite of an anxious person because I just, if it's not in my control, I'll like just put it over there. Tell me your secrets. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. But... I'm not, I am not bulletproof. I'm a human being and I'm aware of that. And I feel like, you know, I've spent the last however many years building this control around me, like every area of my life. It's just, I can turn that up, I can turn it down. If I, like, for example, I went through a few years where um, I just don't think I was a very kind person. I think I was a bit ruthless. I was ruthless with like my ex I was ruthless with friends and I when I look back on that couple of years of my life I don't think I was a very kind person but I realized it quickly and I was like that's okay I'll, let's let's learn how to be kind let's learn active listening let's learn empathy because I realized that that was a weakness so it's very controlled but I am aware that I'm a living breathing human and I feel like I don't know when, but at some point I'm going to either get burnt out or, because that's something people talk about a lot, I've never experienced it, but I can see how I'm like rolling towards it. Or I'll get to a point in life where I just look back and think, I wish I'd have just let go. Like my, I can't get drunk as a person, like ever when I drink alcohol, because I, I know after three drinks, I'm out of control. So non, no one's ever seen me in like a drunken state, like a liability. As in you will stop at yeah. a certain oh, yeah. point because you don't like the feeling of losing yeah. control. That's it. So after a certain point, after, I mean, I don't drink that much anyway, but if I was to like go on a night out with friends, I would be the first one to go home. And then people are like, oh, stay on. No, I'm going home. No one remembers anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. They don't. But I've been like that for a long time. And I feel like at some point when I maybe, I don't know, maybe when I retire, maybe when I'm a lot older, I'll look back and think, that wasn't what your 20s were for. Like, you should have just let go and, like, made some mistakes and just been a bit more silly with things. Because right now I'm very controlled and, yeah. So I can see how it'd be, it's, I don't see it as a weakness right now, but I can see where my blind spots are and I feel like at some point they're going to come creep up on me. Mm. Well, you haven't experienced it yet, but so, you know, talking about things you can't control, then just don't worry just about don't it until you do, right? Um, going back to your experience at Harrods, and that's a really interesting point, being very young, thrown in the deep end, having to manage people who are older than you and having to make decisions without any kind of training. What were your biggest fears then? I mean, obviously going and having to fire somebody, that's that's a big deal. That's that's hard for anybody to do. I mean, I talk to very senior CEOs and and that's something that they themselves struggle with. But what were your what were your fears? What were your main challenges at that point? Um I'm gonna go back to the telling someone off. And when I say this, I always put it in quotations of anyone listening, not watching, it's telling someone off in quotation marks, was my biggest fear because I thought that's what managers did. I thought managers were the the boss and they told people off when they did something wrong. And every day that I'd go into work, I would dread someone coming in late because I knew that I'd have to tell them off. And and I had to make a choice, either ignore it or say something. And a lot of the time I ignored it. So that was my biggest fear, was having to 
what I know now would be have a difficult conversation with someone. Um, I was always worried that someone was going to turn around and say the same thing that that lady said to me when I let her go, which was, who do you think you are to tell me that I've lost my job? Or who do you think you are to tell me that my uniform is, you know, this was the level of control we had at Harrods as well. We had to go through metal detectors and our uniform, every single hair had to be in place. So it was- I remember. Yeah. Nail polish, lipstick, skirts, hair. Yeah. Our area manager came in once and we, because I didn't actually, I wasn't employed by Harrods. I was employed by um, like one of the smaller companies that worked within Harrods, but we did all the Harrods training and stuff and obviously worked there every day. Um, and our area manager came in one day and he took me to the side and he said, Heather, um, one of your hairs on your head is falling out of your bun. Can you go to the toilet and fix it, please? And I was mortified. <laughs> Looking back now, I wish I'd have turned around and gone, I'm not, I am won't say the swear words, I'm thinking in my head. But at the time, because I was very put together and like I knew that I ironed my uniform every single morning, everything was in place. So the fact that a hair had fallen, and it wasn't, for, you know, we didn't need it in a net or anything. It was just purely aesthetic. It, it infuriates me that that was like the level of expectation because it's completely impossible. It's an impossible standard to hold anyone to and to put an employee in that position to just fill them with fear every single day on the shop floor that any minute they're going to turn around and someone's going to tell them their hair's out of place or, you know, the, the dress isn't long enough or any anything. It just, yeah. It's- I'd like to talk about that because what you were saying about telling people off mm-hmm. I work, my first kind of proper job was working on a shop floor, very close to where I live. And it was a small boutique, so it wasn't anywhere near the size of Harrods, but this idea of everything being pristine and perfect, not a hair out of place. You're not allowed to lean on anything. You, you, you have to always like be presentable. And I remember one of the jobs you had to do when there was no one in the store. And actually there's lots of like dead time because you can, you really trying to figure out how you can just keep your brain going, which is why I couldn't last there very long. And one of the things we had to do is put hooks, uh, not hooks, um, what are they called? We had to put hangers. So one this way and one the other way. And then you had to do that throughout the store, but especially in the beginning. And I remember I just spent like an hour going through, you know, making sure that, you know, there's like two fingered width, the hangers are apart, etc. And my boss comes in And he says, you've missed one. I wanted to strangle him because you're thinking it's already like, it's already perfect. And there's just one thing that you have pointed out, not acknowledging any single thing that I have actually done. But going to your point, this idea of telling somebody off, I think that's the style. That was the style Mm -hmm. because it wasn't about what you're doing well. It's about what you're doing wrong. Yeah. And having to tell somebody that you're doing something wrong all the time. Personally, I don't think it's very effective. No, and like standards are important. Standards, um, processes, principles, core values, having guardrails for the team, things like, I don't even disagree with having a standard that you put the hooks the opposite way around and you have a two finger space, absolutely fine. It's the way that those standards are enforced that can become a problem. And like you said, the manager, who, whoever it was, would come in and just say, this is wrong. That's not okay. What I would do, what I would suggest in that situation, would be potentially sit you down and say, the store looks great. Um, I've noticed this thing's out of place. Can we just check that the process is right and that you've got all the support you need to make sure that that's right every time? Because you're not in trouble per se there like you've not necessarily done something wrong it's just that something slipped and maybe it's the process or you know and it you don't need a telling off again quote unquote i hate it it makes me feel a bit sick when i say telling someone off but that's what it used to be that's what i was terrified of one of the things you were talking about was making the wrong decision Mm -hmm. so i wonder if you can talk about that yeah as leaders, managers, you, you're, I read a stat once. It was like every day, the average human being makes 35,000 decisions subconsciously every single day. 
when we are in a leadership position, those decisions are more important because they affect other people. So they're not necessarily that you're a more important person, but your decision-making capability is more important because you will probably impact tens, if not hundreds of people with the decisions you make. And so we need to be very aware of that. And I knew this as a young person. I knew that my decisions had a huge knock-on effect to everyone in the team. Shift patterns would affect family life. They would affect um, work-life balance. They would affect people's happiness at work. And something as small as creating a shift managing you know, like a rosa and all of a sudden you've pissed 20 people off and you've ruined a family day and you've you know things that seem quite small can really create a big impact and so yeah I was absolutely I was terrified of making decisions to the point where and I think a lot of people in management positions do this now instead of making a decision that might upset people but it is for the best they just don't make a decision and they just leave it and keep them and the team and the business in the same place because all they want to do is be liked. They want to look for approval. And so you just, as a manager, you can get into a headspace where you avoid decision-making because you're trying to avoid upsetting people. You, you want approval. We're all, that's all we are at the end of the day is we're all massive people pleasers. And unless you, as a leader, become aware of that and put things in place to ever let that impact your decision making you're just going to make a decision that pleases people around you i think it's i think it's called affinity bias is the type of bias that is it's just we are naturally more inclined to make a decision even if we can see it's the wrong one we're more inclined to make a decision based on who we believe is going to like it it's the same reason we pick career paths that our parents are going to be happy with and we wear clothes that fit in we just we just want to make people happy to group think yeah. Mm. I guess it comes down to wanting to feel like you belong somewhere and that you are similar to other people, that you don't really want to break that bond. But it has its price. It has the cost. Mm -hmm. How did you work around that? So not wanting to make the wrong decision. Like what What did you do? I'd, honestly, at Harrods, I didn't. Like I didn't start to overcome a lot of these things until I was somewhere around the 23, 24 year old mark. So at Harrods, I just made all the mistakes. Like that was the almost like Petri dish for my growth because it was just where everything went wrong. And I only stayed there, I was only there for eight months because I, I hated it and I, I can't blame anyone. I do definitely think I needed more training, but like it wasn't right for me. It didn't fit with who I am as a leader and a person, that level of control and level of discipline and everything needs to fit into a box just didn't, did not fit with me. And so I moved on, went into the second SAS company, which I wasn't in a management position there, but sat next to the CEO. So got to see every single part of what it meant to be a leader in a company. And then when I was, oh, I think it was like 22, maybe going into 23 years old, I moved back up north to Manchester and joined Go Proposal, which is the startup that I stayed with for nearly five years. Stayed with for nearly five years and um, the one we ended up selling, moved into Sage, etc. But it was at the point, there was a breakthrough moment for me. Um, and breakthroughs are instant. Like things happen and happen and happen, but any breakthrough isn't years. It happens instantly. And you usually only know the moment in hindsight. And for me, the moment was when a member of my team, and it was a small team at the time, I think we had maybe six or seven people and I was managing the marketing team. A member of my team came to me and he was not doing very well. He was, he, he was being performance managed. He wasn't really performing well. And he came to me and sat me down and said, um, I want a pay rise. And I was like, what? And I just like, and, and I turned it down and I was like, I, I understand, but you're not there. Like your performance is not there. So I had that conversation. I went home and I was like, there are people in this world getting things, people way less qualified than me, people who have like less skills, I want to say, like less qualified who are getting things that I want 
because they just have the courage to ask. Like, that guy, all props to him, had the courage to sit his boss down, even when he was doing crap at work, and say, I want a pay rise. The audacity. Yeah, the audacity, <laughs> but also... Do you know, I have this phrase now. I have this phrase now when I'm getting myself worked up about something and it's quite like quite a courageous move. I just think, come on, have the courage of a straight white man. <laughs> and I think back to that moment of like someone that was doing so badly did not deserve the thing, but still had the courage to go and do the scary thing that so many people don't do. But he did it. And a lot of other managers would have gone, yeah, let's figure something out. And, you know, in the next six months we'll do it. And, it was that moment that I was like, all this imposter syndrome I had, it's just bullshit. It's, it's just wrong. It, I need to just get rid of it. And so I went on a bit of a journey. And as part of that journey, it, it saw me. And I can, I can go into the kind of things that I do now and have done over the last like five years to work with imposter syndrome, use it to my benefit. But it was o over that journey that I saw the huge career growth for me. Um, I went from managing... A very small team to being the operations director of a big team selling to Sage, the FTSE 100 company. So working with thousands of people, leading five different teams and being put in a lot of rooms, a lot of rooms with a lot of people who were much more experienced than me would just kind of like, I would be sat there thinking, this is interesting that I deserve a place at this table. But in the back of my mind thinking, yeah, I do. And I'm okay with this. And I'm okay that what I bring to this table is that I don't have experience. I don't have like old way, older ways of working. Um, so that was the breakthrough moment. Was that something that your boss appreciated about you at the time? Yeah. And were they explicit about it to you? Yes. Yeah. It was, I was, and this is why I say to everyone, don't settle in your job because a lot of people, a lot of people listening to this, a lot of people out there have bad bosses. And whilst everything you do in your career will be directed by you and you will impact it. You will be the one that changes things. You need to find someone who's going to believe in you. And I think most people who have done really well in their career will have a story of this person gave me an opportunity. And that's where when we get into like what, what I think leadership is, that's now my job is to give other people opportunity to pass that hand back down because people did that for me. It's the only reason I got to where I was like, asking for help, other people who were way further ahead of me, giving me opportunities that they didn't have to, they didn't have to go out of the way to do it. And so if you are listening to this now and you feel stuck, you feel like you want to go on this huge career trajectory, you feel like you can do it, you've got the skills, you've got the work ethic, but you're not getting the opportunities at your work. If you've had those conversations very directly, so don't give up straight away. If you've had the conversation, if you first of all, go and have the conversation with your boss, but if you are just getting stuck and the ceiling is not going anywhere, move. Because you need to find a company that is going to support you. You cannot do it on your own. One of the biggest reasons why people leave any jobs is having a bad boss. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's so essential to work with somebody who has your success as part of their own success metric. Because if they don't, if they're not invested in making you successful, you will A, learn bad habits. You know, you will start telling people off if that's what your boss is doing. But also you will not progress as much as a person who has someone who is really motivated to help them. Mm -hmm. So especially for young people, and I wish I had known that earlier, look for a boss that you like, respect, admire, but also pay attention to how much they are invested into your success, whether they actually help you. So I think it's like the number one criteria. So your advice about go and work with a CEO, go and work with a founder. Yes, that's great, but also make sure it's the right CEO and the right founder. Definitely. Mm. And just, yeah, don't, don't settle, do not settle for I have so many people on Instagram. I want to say at least 10 people a day message me on Instagram to tell me they are either in a management position or looking to move into a management position, but their boss isn't giving them the support. They're, they're, they're getting stuck every time they ask, every time they show 
like who they are and go for the opportunities they're getting stuck my advice is always the same have the firstly have you had a really direct conversation and i mean be honest with yourself about that have you sat them down and said i want to progress into a management position within the next 12 months or within the next six months and whatever that is how do i get there what do you need me to do so that this time in 12 months i am leading a team in this department or in another department if they say that's the only way you can truly know because at that point they have to say to you we don't have that available in which case it doesn't align with your goals you've got to go or they'll say yes let's do it and they'll take you along this road but you will because you've asked so directly you will very quickly know if they're bullshitting you so you'll very quickly learn if you get six months in and they've not done the things they said they would do time to go or you'll be in the mucky middle somewhere and again i would say probably time to go but maybe just have another direct conversation to be to be clear but before you've had that conversation a lot of people think that a lot of people put their career success in the hands of others they think that their manager is gonna magically just like take them on this journey and give them all the opportunities the majority of them aren't you have to be your biggest cheerleader post on linkedin about your successes make sure that when you go into one-to-ones with into one-on-ones with your manager you take these are my big wins for the week this is the project i've completed these are the kpis how i've hit them how i haven't what i'm going to change what i'm going to do go and give them all the information don't assume they know that you be in complete control of your career and do never 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 leave it to someone else and as soon as you start to see that you're in a company or you've got a boss that is holding you back either purposefully or by accident get out of there because they're not going to change um can you see now how i'm linking this to like me controlling every part of my life like that's it's just been a theme along the way like when things weren't progressing enough for me i was like no i'm going and it's hard to change jobs because it feels like jumping into the unknown and like the grass isn't always greener but you just have to you have to like look at the trajectory of your career path right now are we going to accept this for the next 20 30 50 years if not change it now if yes fine you stay you stay there if you're if you're happy please stay where you are because if you're happy the grass likely isn't greener but if you are not happy for this to continue people stay with companies for years and years and years and years always like hanging on to that string of i might get promoted next year or maybe they've they've only given me a one percent pay rise this year because the money's tight maybe next year they're saying it's a promotion it's not like if they all want 100 percent back in your success get out of there mm. I like to unpack what you said. I mean, one is taking things into your own hands. So, you know, don't rely on your boss, Mm -hmm. but also find the boss that is going to be invested in you and sing your own praises. I'd like to kind of touch on that because that is something that was really hard for me personally, because I was the sort of person that's like, my work is just going to get noticed. You know, someone's going to pay attention to it. And, you know, that's enough. And it really isn't. And it's not so much about, you know, shouting from the rooftops, like, you know, oh, look how great I am. Part of it is also taking a moment and reflecting on your own successes. And I think it's very easy to just be like, and the next thing and the next thing, rather than to be, you know, to look and reflect on what you have achieved and how you've done that in order to use that as a, like a, what's the word? To use it as a a springboard to your next success. Like, where are you going with that? And be more strategic with regards to, you know, being clear, what do you want? And I really like your advice when you're saying, when you go to your boss, have a very clear idea about what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Because, and say, and also have the time, frame it's like I want to be a manager you know in 12 months time how can we make that happen and I think it's very tangible it's either a yes or a no and when you said about being in the mucky middle it's so true that people kind of get stuck on it Mm -hmm. Um, I did this video for the podcast which is called quit or grit looking at the five c's of job satisfaction I mean, I'll link it into in the comments, but I thought that was 
there's a little quiz you can do to decide whether you should stay or basically whether you should leave your job. Um, but going back to people what's staying... In, what's in that? Sorry. So the five Cs. Yeah. Clarity. Yeah. So that is, you know, having a very clear idea about what you're actually doing in your role. Mm -hmm. And clarity can mean different things for different people because in a startup, for example, you know, some people will be a lot more comfortable with less clarity. Yeah. So, that, you know, you, but that's your personal preference, right? Some people really like to know exactly what to do every single day. So clarity to what you feel comfortable with. Um, the second one is control. So how much autonomy you have within your role. And my perspective is that the more control you have in your role, the more opportunity you have to enjoy it and to also to take it in the direction that you want. Um, the third one is challenge. And this is more of a Goldilocks setup where you don't want it to be too easy and you don't want it to be too hard. It needs to be matched with the level of your experience and strengths. So it needs to just push you just a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. So as I said, it's not either or, it's like it's that happy, not happy medium, but slightly beyond, like slightly above the medium. Then there is the career growth. So this is, you know, how much opportunity you have to progress or you have an idea of what's going to happen. And the fifth one is, I call it culture or connection to your boss. So essentially who your boss is. Yeah. And that in itself can make it or break it because you can have, you know, amazing colleagues, you can have, you know, great career progression, you can have lots of clarity, but if you're not getting on with that person, it's like being in a dysfunctional relationship you just will be so miserable and unhappy and resentful that you won't actually bring your full self to work. So I think younger people though, now, I mean, looking at what people complain about Gen Zs is that they jump too frequently and too often um, and too quickly from one role to the next, as opposed to, you know, the boomer generation that will life is. What's been your experience? I just, I think you just can't blame them. I think there is some awful companies out there that need to wake the hell up and realize that society is only going one way. If you think people are job jumping now and not settling, you wait till we're 10 years down the line. And there's a very, so my team in five years, not a single person ever left, ever. We had Gen Z, we had boomers, we had every different generation. No one ever left. There is, and I know other companies like that, they are in the minority, but it is not impossible to create a culture that works for everyone. The f and if, if you have a huge turnover rate of staff or you just have a like low engagement, and when we say low engagement, you can tell if you have low engagement because people don't turn up to meetings on time. They don't hit deadlines. Like that's when you know your team aren't engaged is when you feel like you're pushing the boulder up the hill and no one's helping you do it. So if you've got either of those two things, you need to first look at the working arrangements, like flexible working. You can put in, so the flexible working policy that we had that worked really well for all generations, all ages, types of people and worked around different schedules is give people t a, an amount of days you want them to come into the office. So how many, how many hours do you want people to spend in the office? And to me, that's something that's really important to create connection within the culture. But also I personally do not believe it's healthy for people to be working from home all the time. And I think I have a duty of care to my team to make sure they get time in the office, in a, in a psychologically safe environment where they can come and experiment, they can be challenged, they can be fulfilled and they can go home at the end of the day to their loving family. And create a set of hours that's very clear we want you in the office so let's say it's two days a week but those days and those times are flexible so what we did was say we want people to spend it was actually two and a half days a week for us so we wanted people to spend 50 percent of the time in the office and it didn't matter what days it was it didn't matter what times it was it was just that we wanted people to have 50 percent of their time being spent in the office and it wasn't really measured we would just trust people and like 
it was on their manager if they thought someone was kind of slacking with it a little bit they could have a conversation with them it wasn't policed as we used to say um 50 percent of the time in the office but we had flexible working hours so people could work there nine to five any time from like half six in the morning till nine o'clock at night so it, that meant if they wanted to shift their working day till later take the kids to school come into the office for four hours and then go home in time for the school pickup they could do that it meant that if they were a carer they could be at home like one of the girls in the team had to care for her nana on a tuesday she could still come into the office we didn't mandate the days but she could still come into the office and get the face-to-face time that i believe she needed but she could also be, do her carer role that she really wanted to do because she enjoyed it and so there are ways that you can create something at an environment that works for the company so you get people into the office you get the culture thriving you get human connection but people are very free over when they come in how they come in how often they come in like can you see do you see what i mean how something like that can work for everyone um and then if ever because there's such a culture of trust if ever that didn't work for someone you would have play you would have a space for them to come and tell you like we had someone who was um, going through like the immigration form visa process and they had to spend some time back in their home country and it was just like, we just work around it, we can make it work. The value at the heart of that was just that I knew, I had seen, and at this time, honestly, we had no stats for it. Like there was no facts, there was no stats to back this up. I could just really see it that people spending time together in the office I didn't care about productivity. I don't. I don't care about the stats about productivity. I'm not. The last thing I want from my team is all I care about is how productive they are. That's like the opposite of what I'm trying to do. But what I care about is that when they finish their working day, they have utilized their strengths. They feel challenged. They feel fulfilled. They feel like they're working towards a purpose. And I could see how being at home, and obviously in COVID we had to be at home, how being at home all the time took that away. People were getting. I had one of the guys came to me, he was having real trouble with his mental health because he lived in a flat, it was a studio flat, he was on his own. Real trouble with his mental health. I saw relationships break down because people just aren't supposed to be in that close space with their partner for that long. So I saw it as my duty and, it, and I got a lot of stick for it because um, I used to talk about it online saying, you know, how dare you tell people that they've got to spend money on traveling and they've you know got to spend money now on their lunch and it's time away from the kids but I just knew it the long-term impact of people working from home 24 7 wasn't good that's all I could say that's all I knew in my stomach that was what my gut feeling was telling me so I wanted to create a space at work that people loved to come to and then put some guardrails around it just some very loose guardrails to say this is 50% 50% of the time we expect you in, but you can come in whenever, whatever days, whatever times. But I know I want you to come into the office for this amount of time. It's about creating an environment where people want to turn up to work mm-hmm. as opposed to being mandated to be there. Or if they have things going on in their personal lives or whether it's mothers working and they're needing to like pick up their kids or you have certain hobbies that you, you know, really want to practice outside of your work, whatever it is that you have a reason to turn up Mm -hmm. to your work because otherwise if you're forced to do any of that, then it becomes a chore. Um, I, I see what you mean about working from home being difficult for mental health and I think when you are too isolated from the people that you work with and from the kind of like the main purpose but I see that more a problem for younger people as opposed to the older generations who have had experience of working from the office and already have some kind of an understanding of how to balance their work and their life as opposed to younger people where they just become very isolated from, you know, the work that they're doing and also living in smaller apartments, potentially sharing with flatmates, lots of distractions. And I think it's harder to to manage that. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find that for the younger generation, so the young, the generation Z, that for, for them, generation Z, that generation <laughs> Z, um, 
that they really do crave that flexibility with regards to work? Is that something that's really high on their agenda? Yeah. Pe- the thing that any manager, leader needs to know about Gen Z is that they want choice. They want choice over what they do. They want choice over working hours, working times. And you can provide that choice with guardrails and you just have to find spaces for that choice to show up. So for example, like I've like listened to a lot of stories recently of um, managers who really struggle because their Gen Z employee will come to them and say things like, um, say you ask them to do something outside of their job of role and responsibility and they're flat out just saying no. And this might not be everyone, but I've heard quite a few stories of this recently. So manager will ask employee, oh, can you do X for me today? They'll come to them and say, that's not in my job role, so I don't want to do it. And who's to say that they're wrong? But here's the thing, like, because it isn't in the job role. So who's to say we can't dictate if we've sold them a job, we can't then change it and dictate that. However, what you need to make sure that they know is that by them making that choice, and this is what's really fair to educate them on, by them making that choice, they're going to hold themselves back from growth. So we are absolutely happy for this, for you to stay within your roles and responsibility, because that's what we've hired you for, and we will keep making sure that your pay matches the going rate and market inflation and whatever, and however you grow within that role. But just to let you know, if you continue to say you're not taking on anything outside of your roles and responsibilities, please don't expect then to have huge pay rises, to have huge promotions, because we're really going to struggle to see how you're working with us as a team. And so give them that choice. Give Gen Z, you know, give people the choice because there are a lot of Gen Z people out there who we hear the horror stories and the word, whenever I talk about Gen Z, people use the word entitlement. But there are also a lot of Gen Z who want to really push and really grow, but also want to close the laptop at five o'clock and don't want to be working on that. And I get it. Like I'm somewhere in between whatever, I'm 1995. So some definitions say that I'm Gen Z. And I just get it. Like I've seen the corporate world where people do sell their soul to their job because they have been told by society that the measure of success for them in life is climb a ladder, get the extra paycheck, buy the bigger house, buy the nicer car, have the 2.5 kids or whatever it is. That's what they've been sold as the American dream. And that's what everyone buys into. And so I get why Gen Z are like this and I just think we need a bit more empathy. And honestly, like whenever I get annoyed with Gen Z, because I do, it's natural, I think, to kind of go, oh, really? I I find it's like a bit of jealousy, like like a spike of jealousy to think, how can you do that? Because I used to graft. Do you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. I used, I had to graft my way here. So how dare you try and get there without grafting? But then you just have to check yourself and go, of course it's jealousy because it's right. Like they're doing the right, they're doing the right thing. So just make sure that we, we just need to make sure we don't tar Gen Z all with the same brush. They need to be dealt with as individuals. Some people will be very happy to stay within the limits of their roles and responsibilities and just get inflation pay rises, maybe a nice bonus every now and again, if they're doing a good job. And that as a job role is incredibly valid and important. We can't have everyone wanting to take over the world. And so like, that's incredibly valid and important. But find the people who do want the extra responsibility, do want to grow, do want the promotions, pay rises, want to be in directoral positions and nurture them as such, like nurture it back into them, but just don't tarnish everyone with the same brush. Mm. Which what happens a lot. On that boundary piece with Gen Zs, I think there's something to learn from that mm-hmm. for everyone. Because when you are so comfortable to say, actually, this is not something that I'm either comfortable with doing or it's not part of my role description, you know what? Good for yeah. you. Oh my God, yeah. Good for you. Because I know in my experience, I didn't feel like I could ever say no to yeah. anything that my boss requested, whether it's pick up a coffee or, you know, pick up dry cleaning or whatever it is. And sure, 
there are moments when you need to muck in and you know roll your sleeves up and do things outside of your remit but how often do those things really happen exactly so i think everybody should pick up some tips like we have a lot to learn from from there we do yeah i'm going to tell a story and that you might want to cut you might want to cut this out but i'm going to i'm going <laughs> to tell you it because it's a bit brash but i'm going to tell is you anyway juicy <laughs> So I was at I was at the pub with some friends. This was last summer, and there was a I always want to say girl when I reference my friends, even though we are fully fledged women now. For some reason, I always want to say the girls. Anyway, it was with, with my friends at the pub, and she, the woman that we were with, she was thirty years old, so classed as millennial. Her younger sister was twenty three or twenty four, so Gen Z. And she said, she was telling this story how a sister had gone on a date, 23 year old, a sister had gone on a date and this guy was basically an arsehole. He was like really mean to her. And she left halfway through the dinner. So the girl left halfway through the dinner and was like, I'm not putting up with this shit, I'm going home. The, the millennial who was telling us the story about her sister went, it's really funny because when I was her age, I probably just would have shagged him anyway. And is in that moment, I was like, and like I said, you can cut this out if you want to. That's the that's the difference between the generations. It's like Gen Z are finally, because of course we should have gone home. Of course we should have said, no, I don't want to go home with this guy. He's been horrible to me. But sadly, they were the boundary. We used to put up with that. We'd just be like, I'm already on this date. I feel like I owe him something. I don't, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to come across as harsh. Like, I'm just going to go home with him anyway. And that's, if you put it into that perspective, that's where Gen Z have got it right. And they're really like pushing, especially women and a lot of people of color, like just people who are, have been brought up without the comfort blankets of the world are finally going, no, this is not good enough. I'm not putting up with this anymore. And the people who have had the comfort blankets can then start to rip them off and go, yeah, and let me help pull you out of that. And that's what Gen Z are doing. And when you put it just into a bit more of a personal context, they're the boundaries that they're setting. And when my friend told that story, I was like, that is at work. Like, that's what it's like. They're, they're setting boundaries. They're going, no, it's not good enough. Like, I don't care that you're my boss. I don't care that you're a man that's 20 years older than me that's telling me what to do. It's not right. And just because you pay my check wage at the end of the month does not mean I'm going to put up with it. So when you put it into a context like that, you've really got to just empathize with them and think. And also empathize in the sense that they were brought up into a very different world from people who were just fractionally older than them. So I've said I'm 28, but I was brought up without mobiles, really. I was part of a generation that like we didn't take phones to school iPhones became a thing, I think, when I was like 16, but we didn't have them because they were really expensive. And when I maybe got into sixth form, like that was when people would be like playing games on their phone. But it wasn't, I still was very much brought up in a world without technology. Um, and like I remember, I remember being maybe 15 and we'd come out, we'd have a computer in the house. And so you could kind of do things on the computer, but you know, Gen Z haven't had that. Like imagine being brought up in a world where everything is given to you in a click like you've got amazon things are being delivered on your doorstep at school the way you learn you don't flick through a textbook you just type it and it comes up in one second so we have to empathize in that like the rate of change of the world has sped up and sped up and sped up and they have gone through such a drastic change and we're just not set up for them yet we're not ready we're not ready for them to enter the workforce and so to use words like entitled and lack of work ethic like yeah of course of course they do. Who's wrong? You know, we can stay stay in our ways. Or There's different generations working together under one roof. That's when you get the tension. But I always talk about this idea of creative tension where disagreements between individuals are very a key because you are getting two different perspectives to either change somebody's mind or potentially come up with something completely brand new because that's the power of having diversity of thinking within your business. I mean, talking about diversity and you know having more women, people of color, but it's also age. It's also mm -hmm. having okay. different perspectives of, of how you view the work and how to get things done. 
and the power of having difficult conversations, which is something that you talk about. So what advice do you have? So say, let's say for younger people about how to have difficult conversations. Oh, um, I would say start by getting it. Difficult conversations excite me now and I love them and love the opportunity to have them because a few years back, someone had a difficult conversation with me. It was my boss at the time. And we just had a really important meeting with people we were about to sell the business to. I was proving that the business ran without the business owner. I was the ops director. And so I was doing a lot of the talking, a lot of the sales. I was doing the presentations. And this multi-million pound sale has kind of like rode on my back. We'd had this meeting and my boss came out of it and said to me, this is going to hurt. I need to give you some difficult feedback. You talk way too fast and I can't understand what you're saying. I was so hurt. Like it was like someone had stabbed me in the gut and twisted it around 10 times. And I went to bed that night in a hotel and I was just, I was just good. I was like, everything I've worked towards, I'm going to ruin it. And yeah, all the negative feelings that come along with that. But then a couple of weeks passed and I just realized it's a weak, it's just a weakness. I just need to fix it. Like, how do I, I went and listened to podcasts about finding confidence in your own voice. I went and listened to like public speaking advice, podcasts, YouTube videos. And over the next year or two, public speaking, being on podcasts became a huge part of my work. And it's the reason I have been able to leave full-time employment and set up my own business because I built a platform on my voice, being on stage, being on podcasts, being on videos. If I hadn't got that feedback, who knows if I had just continued to be a really bad speaker and never have got any of the opportunities that I get today. So my first piece of advice is get the feedback, like ask your team if you're in a management position go and ask your team to all bring you one piece of difficult feedback and just get used to understanding how that feels it should unlock greatness in you because you will start to be told your blind spots like i don't I had this conversation with someone yesterday i actually don't like praise and i know it it doesn't sound like i'm being truthful there when people give me praise it makes me feel really icky i'm like right can you just ugh, stop like i'm okay i'm fine i know and I, I know i'm comfortable with who i am can you help me find the bad stuff now and like if ever i had an appraisal people tell me all the good stuff i'd be like yeah but what's wrong i'm like nothing i think you got. i'm like come on you've got to find something come on and so just just go and get go and get that harsh feedback why is that so important to you to get the negative i just see what it does i just see what feedback could not unlock in people but here's the next important part if you if that doesn't unlock something in you and you instead just become bitter and annoyed and stressed or insecure there's some fixing that needs to go on and what usually needs to happen is you need to spend some time probably with actually going to therapy i would say go to therapy and understand what barriers you've put up that doesn't allow weakness there's some sort of blocker there's your ego is somehow not allowing you to be told that you're wrong and there's some work that needs to be done there and if you're in a management position you need to do it fast so go and get feedback at, figure out whether you're someone who takes feedback well or not if you take feedback well you're kind of good to go like now let's go and let's give it to other people but if not before you start dishing out difficult conversations you need to take a good look in the mirror and break down some of the walls because you can't go out dishing out feedback if you're not willing to take it yourself <laughs> and so, <laughs> so first yeah go and get it go ask your team for it and then monitor your response then give it and start with praise like start with good feedback start with conversations that are feedback but they're easier to have so, I don't know, if someone did something amazing a couple of days before, just go and tell them and just say, you've done an incredible job here. We actually, when we talk about difficult conversations and feedback, people always think about negative stuff. Managers forget praise just as often. And 
you know, like when we work ourselves up and create all these documents about how we're going to deliver negative feedback. Have you ever done that with positive feedback? Like, you should be you should be putting as much time into the positive stuff as the negative stuff so go and give the positive one then you will be ready to give the negative don't sugarcoat it just deliver it up front as soon as possible tell them how you felt tell them what actions they've done and most importantly this is most important in any conversation whether it's personal or at work tell them the impact of what will happen if they continue to to behave in this way and it friendships need a lot of this as well like if you continue to make me feel like this i don't think i can be a friend make sure you tell them the impact and if that impact of a friendship delivering difficult feedback in a friendship may be that that friendship can't continue if they continue that behavior the very last stage in like this is like jedi level when you've mastered difficult conversations is when you encourage it in other people so when you're in a leadership position you feel comfortable enough to, if you overhear someone like gossiping or someone comes to you and complains about another member of the team, encourage them to have a difficult conversation. That's going to open up so many doors for people in your team um, and will ultimately just create a culture of, in the moment, candid feedback. Yeah. Feedback is such an interesting one and being open to it, I think it's a skill. And I know when I was younger, I found any kind of criticism really deeply hurtful Mm -hmm. because deep down, I knew it was true. And deep down, I knew that I was already working on it. So someone pointing it out was as if like, oh my God, I've just been found out. Like you're trying to put on such a like brave face, perfectionist face that someone realizing that something you're not good at or whatever that really deeply hurt. And I recently did a an episode with Kate Waterfall Hill, who's also yeah, a leadership. legend. She's amazing. Yeah. And I lo- honestly, I, I wish I could meet that woman. I know she's probably lives not far from me, but yeah. I should I should introduce you. I yeah. mean, she is fantastic. She is. And yeah. I went and I did a values exercise with her and it opened up so many things because part of the exercise was asking your kind of colleagues, your friends, for how they perceive your character. So this is not a performance thing. This is about you as a person, as a human being. And some things came back that were really interesting, but also really painful for various reasons. And in the end was extremely eye-opening and helpful because it really helped to really define what I found valuable Um, and what was important to me. And whilst I was doing this exercise, I was also reading a book by Tara Moore, who I quote all the time, called Playing Big. And one of the chapters she has is, and don't quote me on exactly on the title, but something along the lines of unhooking from praise and criticism. So what was really interesting about that is that, yes, you want to have the feedback, you want to have, you know, praise, but it's also being smart and strategic what you listen to and what you don't. And this is both when it comes to praise and criticism, because criticism, you know, it's it's subjective. It's another person's opinion. And you can take that on board and say, actually, it doesn't, it's actually not really that relevant. But sometimes it is relevant. And that's when you can make quite big changes. And the same thing with praise, where if you seek praise too much, then you become dependent on it and that the people pleasing Mm -hmm. and looking externally rather than internally. So it teaches you to go deeper into yourself and be much more self-reflective about Oh, yes, people are saying I'm good at that. Okay, but I don't really need a pat on the back about it. It's great that I have it. And people are saying these negative things, but actually, you know what, deep down, I don't believe even if that's true. Yeah. And that really made me less sensitive about receiving feedback because it's not 100% yeah, true. You get to decide. Yeah. And you get to decide. But if you're repeatedly hearing the same things, Perhaps maybe that's something to and pay attention just to. Just listen to your emotional response. Like mm. our body, our gut, there's 
we call it a gut feeling because when something like sparks our nervous system or our stress levels, our gut is the our gut microbiome is like the thing that will react and tell us. Anyone who's listening who does biology, please just, <laughs> just like skip over that. But it's, it's it is true, and um, yeah, just listen to your emotional response. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, leaders have to be very emotionally intelligent. Like this is, I've written a book that's it's going to come out next year. But the very first chapter is about emotional intelligence and everyone will have heard that phrase, but very few people will know what it actually means. And just like courage, emotional intelligence is a skill that you can practice and you can learn. And if you feel like you're weak at it or feel like you're strong at it, you usually have some learning to do. And so the fir- and the very first step of emotional intelligence is awareness. So it is understanding that when people say things that feel difficult when something angers you stresses you upsets you makes you scared you need you will know your body's response whether you have it written down and are aware of it or not you will know it so like I know that when I'm angry and I don't get angry a lot but when I'm angry I like and it'll be similar in a lot of people actually because it's the phrase of like your blood boils but I go a bit red and like my body feels hot and I feel a bit like like tense that's my anger and people think anger is like a really bad emotion and emotions aren't good or bad there's no good and bad with emotions emotions are emotions and so the problem with anger is people don't know how to manage it it's not that people get angry it's that you don't know how to manage it and so with emotional intelligence you have to become very aware of what makes you angry what makes you stressed what makes you sad and when people give you that feedback if you're emotionally intelligent have practiced that skill of being aware of your emotions you will straight away know if that thing spikes some sort of insecurity, fear, stress, it's probably some right. Like somewhere deep down you think, yeah, I, I know that and mm-hmm. I do need to work on that. Just like it did for me when I got the difficult feedback about how fast I was speaking. I knew that hurt and I knew because I already knew deep down that that was what needed to happen and I'd just been ignoring it. Mm-hmm. But likewise if i've had people come to me before like i had quite a big um friendship fallout a few years ago and it was very amicable i say friendship fallout it wasn't like argumentative it was just a a best friend that we were just going very different ways and our worlds were far apart and we just couldn't make this friendship work and we both got ourselves quite like wound up and upset and we had this long conversation about um like getting rid of this friendship and at the time I had a few like criticisms thrown my way about like who I was being in this friendship and I remember thinking at the time like I took it on board but I thought I don't think that's right like I don't actually think that that's right about me and but never just going no I'm not listening to that they're wrong always just very curious and inquisitive And a few years later, I've realized like it wasn't right. That person was just very hurt and just throwing things my way. There are certain feedbacks that are right, but that one in particular wasn't. But it took me years to figure that out. And then in hindsight, I think I knew at the time that the things that that girl was saying about me weren't who I was. They were just being said in anger and upset and they just wanted to give it to me essentially. Mm. Um, In a good way, like I see it as quite a healthy thing to be honest. Mm. Um. But blame, this is something I really want to talk about. We're all really good at blaming other people for our problems. And there's a quote, and I actually think this is from the Bible, but it probably goes back way before then because it's in lots of like ancient writings, which is when you point one finger in blame, there's always three fingers pointing back at you. And it's this idea that when you blame someone or something, an external factor for your circumstance, it's usually because you are relocating some sort of shame or insecurity in yourself. And so listen very carefully to the way you criticize others. Even with all this work, and I still feel jealousy, I still feel anger, I still feel upset at other people. But listen to that. Like, you know, you might see this other woman on Instagram doing incredibly well. Why is that upsetting me so much? Mm-hmm. What is it that something in me is insecure about this thing? Because I'm blaming her for something. You know, she's only got that success because of X, Y, and Z. What is this in me that's so insecure that I can't see another woman succeed and be just anything but happy? That's where you're going to get some serious growth when you start to see that 
every time you blame an external person or factor for something that's wrong in your life, it's because you are, it's actually like the psycho, like fancy psychoanalytic term is called projective identification. We just project this shame onto other people. And when you become aware of it in a leadership position, especially in the corporate world, because there's a lot of blaming that goes on, you'll start to find your own weaknesses. You'll start to find your own blind spots. So for you, when you are jealous Mm -hmm. of that person, I don't know if you had anyone specific in mind, what did that tell you about yourself? Ooh, probably, so it wasn't even, it wasn't necessarily the feeling of jealousy. That was just like the surface emotion. It was that I was looking at that person and thinking they've only got success because they're pretty. Their videos are only doing well because they, I'm telling you, I'm my deepest, darkest thoughts now. <laughs> Their video is only doing well because they're, um, you know, like had Botox and I haven't had Botox. And you start to realize like the only reason you're annoyed at someone having Botox is because you start to see wrinkles on your own face and you, and you, you think that that's a bad thing. You think like, you know, you begin to realize society has told us that aging is bad. Women can't look wrinkly. So then you start to unpack it and you're like, do I care? Should I go get Botox? Maybe I should. Or should I just accept that I'm, I'm actually happy getting a couple of wrinkles? I'm fine. Neither is the right answer. It's whatever works best for you. But like, it's, all, it's taking back control of that, pointing a finger and going, you're only successful because you've, you look so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And going, why do I not feel beautiful? And why am I threatened by someone else's beauty? And I don't know if there's even answers, but it's just making sure that you're so, so, so aware of like everything that you project, every single response you have is something bubbling up inside of you telling you you are not happy. The stories you tell yourself Mm -hmm. that are not necessarily true. And I'm such a huge believer in listening to your triggers. So like triggers the data. I mean, Susan David, who is an amazing author of Emotional Agility, she talks about how emotions are data. There is no good or bad emotion they just are it's just in the english language at least we have more negative words for emotion Mm -hmm. as opposed to positive ones but they're there for a reason they are there to teach you something about the external and internal world and if only we were to sit down and to listen and really really listen then you can learn something from it and then you can work with it rather than trying to resist it. And I think a lot of pain comes from just resisting that uncomfortable state because you just want to escape it. And hence, you know, you start creating stories or you distract yourself or you start doing things that actually don't serve you. And that emotional intelligence piece in leadership and becoming self-aware is so key because without that, without the understanding of self, it's very difficult to understand other people. Mm -hmm. And I like what you say about how it's something that you can develop and and grow. Definitely. Just, yeah, just even something as simple as like journaling. At the end of every day, have a notebook by your bed. What emotions did I feel today? What conversations have I had and how did I feel afterwards? And they might all be super positive but ha- why like what was it because did you come out of a conversation feeling really positive because you were praised for something extrinsic and like like if someone says um you look great or like even one for women that i find quite like problematic is people say oh you you look really well and, and like my grandma said it to me before you look really well or like oh you're looking thin or just just a comment on something extrinsic about your body that we're all used to as women did that make you feel good? And if it did, that could be a problem. Like, why are you tying worth and praise to the way that, you know, like, if you're skinny, it might be because you're not feeling great and you've been, like, lacking your eating. That's how, what it was to me a few years back. But I thought that was a compliment. And then you go home and you're like, why did it make me happy that my grandma told me that I was looking thin? Because I know why I'm looking thin. It's because I actually feel a bit rubbish about myself at the minute. So I've stopped eating as much as I should be and my periods are slowing down. That's the truth. But unless you journal and think about these emotions and how they could be problematic and 
like it's really good in relationships i i'm a huge advocate for like over communication in relationships because of course arguments with your other half is absolutely normal but not for argument's sake like we need to have some sort of conflict resolution and i don't you know i don't want to like put principles on everything in life because sometimes you just need a bit of a blooming like girl like you're wrong you're wrong that's okay but then it's to to think about it why are you upset what is it that it's like bringing out in you if you've argued about the dishes why is it because you've had a really shit day at work and you just wanted to come home and things be nice in the house and you don't if you don't feel like your partner's pulling the weight because if that's the case have that conversation don't just shout at each other mindlessly you know because the dishes aren't clean um so yeah i'm also a huge ab if you are in a leadership position and you are not I thought the first question you were going to ask me today, and it's the only question I've prepared for, <laughs> not ask me it, was what do you think a leader is? I'm um, coming to that. Oh, you? Okay. <laughs> but my, I'm going to have to answer it now because we've already got there. But my answer was going to be, my answer is, a leader is someone who is intentional, like intentional about their response, intentional about their actions, intentional about the words that they use. They don't wing life. They're not turning up to work every day and winging decision-making and winging who they hire and like just thinking that because they are confident or skilled in their job, that that makes them good enough to be a leader. They need to be intentional about understanding their emotions, understanding others, being empathetic, overcoming bias, which is a huge one for leaders. Like as long as you are being intentional, not perfect, you don't need to be, you are going to be biased. Like we can't get, you can, will never ever ever be able to move every bit of bias, but just be intentional every day about overcoming it. Intentional about, instead of getting angry and just shouting at a member of your team, take a minute, reflect, why are you angry? Is it, maybe you do need to have that conversation and maybe the angry tone does need to come across because it's serious. But if you haven't thought about that first, you're going to make some big old mistakes and you're going to upset a lot of people along the way. And depending on what kind of leadership position you're in, your team or business will fall apart in the end if you're not intentional about it. Mm. I think just managing your own emotions is such a big skill. And I know that as a parent, for example, that's where I have been tested the most because like lack of sleep, overwhelm, having to think about the safety and happiness of beings that completely dependent on you and they also push your buttons and that has really pushed me to really reflect much more about why am I reacting in a certain way and I think in leadership as well when you have deadlines your shareholders are on your back you know your team is disengaged mm -hmm. how you show up and how you manage your own emotions and how you have those conversations is the thing that will determine how successful you are and how people will respond around you because what you said earlier and I don't remember how you phrased it but you have that responsibility where it spills over you have influence over many different layers of organization or the people who you're managing and if you are not showing up in that way then how can you expect other people to do that yeah I mean it's essentially it's essentially becoming an adult Isn't it? yeah. it's about you know the, the intentionality <laughs> it's about growing up it's about you know leaving poor habits behind and stepping into and owning yourself mm -hmm. and then being able to do that to help other people to step into that as well. How do you think our expectations of what leaders are and what they should be doing changing now? So the, th the thing that we need to remember is that for the first however many thousand years of human history, probably at least until like the 19th century, all we knew about labor and work was like brutal forced labor. This horrific, the most horrific version of labor, which was forced upon people. People weren't paid. They were expected. Slavery. Sl essentially slavery or depending on what class you were, you were born into, that's where you stayed. 
you didn't move and so for the first however many thousand years of human history like we've thought that that was okay fast forward to the industrial revolution and people started to get a little bit more socially mobile the world started to get a bit more globalized we built industries etc and we moved into this like hierarchical bubble which still is not inspiring but was a step in the right direction now and only very 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 recently in the to just put it in comparison to the course of human history have we started to look more like future proofing you have massive companies like google like um netflix who prioritize culture they prioritize flexibility they prioritize core values objectives and key results like the biggest companies in the world prioritize all these really futuristic like empathetic employee first terms and we're still so new to that what we expect now from leaders and the way that i expect and hope the world goes is empathy at the core overcoming bias to ensure that we've got diversity of thought and you will know this really well because bias for me shows up the most in recruitment shows up the most in the hiring process um and just putting human beings what it means to be a human at the middle of everything that we do so some of the values i've got in my business are like existing clients are more important than new clients and that's not that's quite a new concept like you see all the adverts you know get a free trial you get 20 percent off your first two months like everyone's trying to bring new customers in look after your existing ones and the same goes for your team you look after your existing team you build the most flexible loving challenging fulfilling culture you possibly can you will attract the right candidates. You won't need to go and spend thousands of pounds looking for them. You will naturally attract the right candidates and you'll find them. And it's not that the recruitment com- the recruitment process becomes obsolete. It's just that you don't have to go knocking on doors to find the right people. They will already be primed and want to come work for the company. And so the way that I hope and expect the world to go, the world of leadership is just such a big focus on getting back to what it means to be human like let's just completely smash down every single class system that's being built like people are going to be born with privilege and we can't there is nothing we can do about that right now you will have layers of privilege i have layers of privilege and the way i the way i think about privilege is is it's a debt that i have to pay back so now i've i've benefited from that privilege for the first 28 years of my life and had all these great successes in my career as a result and now i just think amazing i'm here i've got this platform now it's my turn let me bring people up who might not have had those opportunities let me use this platform to like level the playing field and the more people we can get on that mission to just level like equity is the word isn't it it's the right word to use just create a world of equity everywhere and it goes both ways as well because like there are a lot of people who don't want massive responsibility they just want to be happy and they're happy to do a job that they're given and they're happy to like just be fulfilled they're happy working with a great team and taking off tasks but we won't know that until we start to be empathetic and start to understand different people and what they love and what they want so that's where i'm hoping and expecting that we go i think it's more individualistic so this idea of getting people to fit in one specific mold, even taking the example of the boomer mentality of you will just do whatever that is asked of you, you're never going to say no. And that what is indicating drive and ambition and that's what gets you the growth. There are people who don't necessarily want to progress or become the CEO and they are perfectly skilled in an area and they're perhaps experts or they're just happy with the status quo and that's okay. We can't have every single person being exactly the same, nor do we need that and it's not even not not necessary. It shouldn't be the case because we need that diversity in businesses. What are the top skills that a young leader needs to develop? 
Um, the first one is definitely difficult conversations. But obviously what we talked about a little bit earlier, but the reason that's so important is it will solve a million and one of your problems. It will solve culture issues. It will help you to overcome your imposter syndrome because when you have those conversations, you'll see how you can't, you don't need to have decades of experience. Like you are very well equipped to give people feedback based on your gut feelings. Um, the second one is having a mindset that is about growth and not perfection. I know that when I was in the first few years of the leadership world, I was so focused on being perfect. I saw mistakes as horrific. I wouldn't allow myself to fail in any small way. And I actually didn't make that many mistakes, but what it meant was I wasn't being courageous. I wasn't doing the things that a leader was supposed to be doing. But if you adopt a growth mindset, you start to you stop caring about being perfect because you don't care about being right. Like there's no, there's no, when you have a growth mindset, it doesn't matter if you're right. It just matters that you learn. What that also helps you to do as a young leader is see that just because you're in a management position doesn't mean you are the number one. You have all the skills, you have all the say. When you have people in your team that are older than you, it's hugely valuable. Like just because their experience might not put them in the best position to be in a management position, it's still experience. It's still very valuable and incredibly useful. And so when you adopt a growth mindset, you will have someone in your team that's older than you. And instead of being scared of saying the wrong thing, what you would do is go to them and say, we've got very different qualities. And I really, I'm so interested in all the experience that you've got and I, I really need it. And I'm actually, you can even open up to them. I find one of the, the best ways to overcome a lot of insecurities is just to vocalize them and to say to the person on your team that's older than you, I actually feel a little bit insecure because I know you've got all this experience. And I, the last thing I want to do is be like giving direction when you've got this wealth of knowledge. So I, can we like make a pact almost? Well, let's work together and I'm going to need your experience. But likewise, like I've been put in this role because I am a brilliant manager and I can really help you achieve your goals. So let's work together. And so adopting this growth over, over perfection mindset, you will just stop caring about being perfect and start thinking, where can I learn? And when you realize that, you realize that the people that are older than you are probably some of the ones you can learn from the most. So go to them and do the learning and, and figure it out. So yeah, get good at difficult conversations, have a growth over perfection mindset. If you ever get to the point where you think, yeah, I've got this management thing down now, I'm gonna stop learning, stop listening. That's a big red flag. So, and you kind of can find comfort in that, knowing that you're not the finished article now, you're never gonna be the finished article. So let's just get on get on the train, go for the journey, go along for the journey. So yeah, difficult conversations, growth over perfection mindset, and you will always be at school when it comes to leadership. It never ends. It never. It never really ends. I like the piece about the growth over perfectionism and this idea of learning because you know there is this tendency to think that there is this ideal world that you always getting things right. And that's just not how life works. You know, we we need to learn how to fail. And I know that Amy Edmondson has just recently come out with a very, very important book, which is, I think it's called The Wrong, The Right Kind of Wrong, which is all about making mistakes. And what she put really brilliantly is that all failure isn't equal. So there are different types of failure. So there is the failure, which is, you know, you had a desired outcome. So, you know, something that, you know, you wanted to win an Olympic gold medal, or you wanted to sell your company for X amount of million, and you didn't get that. So that's one kind of, that's called, a, I think she calls it a failure. Then there is a mistake. So for example, she says, well, milk goes in the fridge and cereal goes in the cupboard, but instead you put the cereal in the fridge and you put the milk in the cupboard. So there is a prescribed way of doing something and you made a mistake. So it's it's an error that 
in the, you know, that should be corrected. There's some really bad ones. For example, if you, you know, operate on a left knee instead of the right knee. So that was what she calls a mistake. And then there are violations. And these are things that purposely have done incorrectly when there is a prescribed standard, which is obviously something that we want to be avoiding. So that first type is the type that we need to do more of because through that process, we learn and we also don't get too attached to an outcome because you know that you don't necessarily are going to get it. You can't predict it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. What's the best piece of leadership advice that you have received? Ooh. I used to be what is defined as a rescuer. So it's a, a term coined by um, Liz Wiseman in her book, multipliers where she talks about the accidental diminishing traits of leaders so accidental diminishing traits are things that we do with the best intention so we do it because we think we're doing a good thing but it diminishes our team by accident and the biggest one that i was falling down on was being a rescuer and it was a mentor a leadership mentor a couple of years ago that made me aware that i was doing this um and she essentially told me that i need to let my team fail she told me like you need to stop saving them bubble wrapping them not allowing them to make mistakes because how do you make someone tough how do you make someone a great employee it's not by making life easy it's not by never letting them fall down and so some of the best it was advice it was through mentoring was that I was being a rescuer and what that looked like in a practical sense was one of my team members, for example, came into work one day with really muddy trainers. And it seems like a tiny thing, came into work with really muddy trainers and we had clients coming in. And I said to her, yeah, like, we don't have many strict rules around what people wear in the office, but I need you to be presentable. Like, I need you to be clean and presentable. Like, that's just a, a minimum standard. Um, and it should have ended there. The conversation should have ended there and it'd have been fine. It was like not a big deal at all she just needed pulling up on it but what happened was she got really upset and had essentially come to me and said I don't know what I should wear like I need fashion help I need fashion advice I'd it end up spiraling 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 and in the end I was sat down with a scrolling through ASOS looking for some new trainers that was me doing rescuing like I was overstepping entirely what I was supposed to be doing because I, I kind of felt bad like I didn't want her to look scruffy at work I wanted to help but that was me going into rescue territory of I've caused a problem, now I'm going to help fix it. Whereas actually, it's just I'm going to point something out and you are a fully fledged adult with a great wage to go and buy yourself a new pair of trainers if needed and I'm sure you can figure out which ones are waterproof so they don't get mucky. Um, and I was doing this on small and big scales every single day, jumping in and helping people. If people had a problem with a client, I would jump in and solve the problem. But by doing that, yeah, you create a team that is entirely bubble wrapped and when some shit really hits the fan, they can't fix it because you, you've you become a bottleneck. You are the only person that can solve problems. So that was some of the best advice I got. Stop rescuing. Like you can help point people's blind spots out. You can help pull people up, but you can't fix their problems. Mm. Um, and it goes into, it's, it's actually quite a, a big issue this now. Now that we talk about mental health more openly, which is obviously brilliant, it's opened up a whole new world of problems at at work because where does the book stop in terms of who's responsible for someone's mental health? And we had a situation a few years back where a member of our team was in quite a depressive state. And really where the book should stop with a workplace and leadership is making sure that work positively contributes instead of negatively so you need to make sure that your workplace isn't negatively contributing to that that you're not stressed maybe give them some time off to go and help potentially yeah what i had done which was another rescuer thing was said work's going to pay for therapy we'll give you time off we'll put you through like essentially a work therapist and we paid for lots of other things for, for this guy what had happened was he in turn 
had no accountability over fixing his own mental health. And if, if you've ever kind of worked with people who are in quite a bad mental state, the only way to fix it is for them to fix it themselves. You can support them, you can give them help, but the only way for them to get out of that place is for them to take action. So for a workplace to just give them everything handed on the plate and say, I'm going to fix it for you, it just will not work. It goes hand in hand with hyper-independence and excessive responsibility taking. This idea that you have hold so much control that you, it's easier for you to know what the person needs to do. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like it's so instinctive that you don't even need to think twice about it. Whilst it's a noble reason to want to help, it can hinder a person from stepping up Absolutely. and doing that themselves. And I, again, talking about triggers, I know I fall into that category where I feel so uncomfortable when somebody is in distress and I know exactly how to help them that I overcompensate for that feeling to try to help them. And just to be able to sit in that discomfort and be like, okay, I know what I need to do, but I mustn't overstep. And my role here isn't to give them the solutions. My job here is to hold space for them yeah. to help them figure it out. Yeah. And it's a very uncomfortable, Super uncomfortable state. And I think just, again, going back to what you were saying about triggers, that is something to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. But um, really good piece of advice. I remember once my... I was at uni and I had no money, like nothing, zero pounds, zero pence in my bank account. And I was on a full court getting petrol, putting petrol in my car. I'd put a fiver in because I think it was like the minimum amount you could put in, gone to pay and didn't have enough money in my bank. I called my mum and I was like, I please, I wouldn't, I'm so sorry to do this. Please, can you just send me like five pound and 10 pence and I'll send you it back in like three days when I get paid. And she said, no. She was straight up like, no got yourself into this problem, get yourself out of it. I had to go and beg the guy on the full court and I was like, I promise I will come back and pay. I had friends at the house down the road that just weren't answering the phone. And I was like, one of them will have a card. They'll have a fiver, they can borrow me. My mum was straight up like, you're not gonna die. She wasn't leaving me in danger. Like I was in a city center. I wasn't, I wasn't in any sort of danger. I wasn't gonna be arrested over a fiver. But at that moment she was like, you will thank me for this. I promise. She's like, you'll you'll thank me for this. And she's not a mean mum. She is the least strict mum in the world, in fact. But there are certain lessons that she was very sure about teaching me. And one of them was to do with money. And it was like, you got yourself into a problem. Because she borrows me a fiver. What happens the week after when it's £50? What happens the week after that when it's £500? What happens 10 years later when I should be having like working a full-time job and I've got myself in debt and all of a sudden I assume it's my mum's fix problem to fix and so that five pound lesson which is a very inexpensive lesson that has no danger but feels a bit uncomfortable I'm sure my mum felt uncomfortable and she was like I didn't didn't feel fair I felt like I was being a mean mum and like I was supposed to protect you at all costs and give you everything and all the opportunities but she was like I know that growing up without having that comfort blanket is what made me so financially savvy and so driven so I can't give that to my child because I know that and she, she gave me every, like the basic human needs were all very much met but when it came to silly things like mum can you send me a fiver because I've overspent she's like you should have walked to work and that's like anti-rescue it's like she didn't like doing that I'm sure it was the last thing she wanted to do was leave me on the forecourt having to figure it out for myself and she probably went and in fact I know she like cried to my dad one day about <laughs> something like it because she was really upset leaving me but it's so important mm -hmm. such an important lesson and it's the same with your team like it would be easier in that moment to chuck a fiver at the problem to go buy them a new pair of trainers anything to just like put a plaster over the problem for now to make it easy but when that problem's 10 times bigger a year later or five years later you can't do that and this, then it gets it's really really difficult to solve mm. so you've just got to let people fall on the last sometimes the lesson is let your children fail yeah <laughs> in small ways it doesn't you know yeah. you can be there like obviously you got beautiful hope. you can put the roof over the head give them food like you can be the mother but without 
if you just bubble wrap your child, your team, whoever it may be, you're just going to create a person that is not tough, that cannot deal with things and that has like bad discipline. So you, you're basically doing them an injustice. If you're always fixing their problems, then they will not have the capacity to focus and figure it out. Well, Heather, I can talk to you for ages, <laughs> for hours, and it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. And really appreciate your time and your wise words. And thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.